can see. Also, hello to whoever is online. Glad you're here as well. Um, I'm going to be diving into the poetic books, which I am excited about. I love, I love these books. Um, so I'm going to pray and then we're going to get started. So Jesus, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for each person that has come out, each person that's joining online and just their, um, diligence to continue pressing in and to continue wanting to learn more about you and wanting to learn more about your word and your word transforms our lives Jesus and so I pray that tonight while I teach and while Ryan teaches that um, ultimately you would teach through us that you would be um, the the best teacher that you would be the teacher in the room we just want to follow you and so I pray that um, you would speak to us through your word it's in your name that I pray Amen. Amen. So poetic books, we've got Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. I'm going to attempt to give you a brief overview of each one, all five of those in the next 35, 40 minutes. So bear with me. Um, I won't be able to give you all the details that I wish I could because each of these books are so fascinating and so good. Um, but hopefully it just inspires you to study them a little more on your own. Before I dive in to the book of Job, I wanted to um, show you a few types of Hebrew poetry that these books kind of fall into. So the first is lyric poetry. This was generally accompanied by music on the lyre. So this is where Psalms would fall into, um, would be lyric poetry. The next um, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, we would see as um, what's called didactic poetry. So it's just using, uh, the point of it is used to communicate basic principles of life. So it's teaching basic principles and things like that. The last thing is dramatic poetry, which communicates its message through dialogue as we see in Job and Song of Solomon. Obviously some of those can, um, you'll see some of the, uh, like Ecclesiastes can kind of look more lyrical or um, the uh, Proverbs can have some dialogue like there's just obviously they kind of fall into different things but those are the main main ones that these books fall into so when I look at the book of Job Job obviously a story of a man named Job if you couldn't guess that from the title um, this was written possibly during the time of the patriarchs which was uh, around Abraham's time so if you think way back to when we talked about Abraham and you kind of put that uh, time frame in your mind this is a Assume, assumed of when it was written. Uh, Job was, if we see in the first chapter of Job, the Lord called him blameless. Job was blameless, he was righteous, and he honored God. Now, a lot of people look at this book and they expect to see an answer for the question of why God allows bad things to happen, especially to good people. Um, and I know I've definitely, when I think of that topic of, okay, hey God, why, why are you letting this happen? My mind goes to Job. But as we see, um, the point of the book isn't necessarily to answer that question. So if you've come in tonight, hoping that I would give you some fancy answer for that, go back to Ryan's teaching the other week because he kind of talked on it. Um, but the point of the book is not to answer that question, but more so to see God's sovereignty and the purpose of true faith. So you can fill this in, it's your first handout. The purpose of the book was to demonstrate God's sovereignty and the meaning of true faith. So sovereignty and true faith. Also pat on the back for myself for creating more fill in the blanks this week. So enjoy that. <laughs> Donna? True faith, true faith. Yep. If you look at Job 1, 8 through 12, um, is it on your handout? I think it is. Okay, awesome. I'm just going to read it real quick. So we see um, this dialogue is picking up um, in the courtroom of heaven. So picture that. So the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. 
Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. All of that like hand and stretching out your hands and whatever that thing. Um, so that's just to describe what is happening here if you're not catching it because sometimes those phrasings get really weird. So there's um, God and Satan and uh, God's like, hey, look at Job. Like he's a great man. He is blameless. God himself calls him blameless. And Job or Satan is trying to say, well, the only reason that Job is following you so obediently is because you bless him so much because you prosper him. But if you were to take away a bunch of what he has, do you think he's going to love you then? And so this was a challenge that Job was posing or that Satan was posing. He said, well, stretch out your hand. Oh, Yeah. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possession have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and touch all he has, and he will curse you to your face. So Satan thought that if uh, bad things happened to Job, then Job would suddenly turn against God. And as we see, so Satan did his work. He took almost everything from Job. Um, and we see that even in the midst of it, Job was so diligent to seek out God, to seek out um, obviously an answer from the Lord, but also just like trying to put his faith in God in the midst of all this too. So it poses questions of, is God just? Does God run the universe on a principle of justice? And if so, how is Job's suffering to be explained? So we see this dialogue between Job and a few of his friends, um, and they go back and forth a few times, and uh, they're, trying to, they're trying to help Job figure out why this is happening, why God would let this happen. Um, and they keep coming back to, okay, God is just. God operates the universe on this principle of justice. So because of that, you must have done something wrong. Like, look at your life. You must have done something. And so they start even creating like uh, little faults or little sins that, oh, you must have done this. And that's why God is doing this to you. Or that's why God is allowing this. But as we see, God already called Job blameless. We know that Job was without fault already. So that wouldn't make sense. Then we see another friend who comes in. Um, he's a little wiser. His name is Elihu. And uh, he gives a different perspective. He says, yes, God is just, God operates the world on this principle of justice. But, and he believes, or he, his input was that um, God, God operates on justice. But with that, as opposed to, how am I trying to say this? The wording is so weird to me. I literally practice this because I keep getting the um, people mixed up and what they say. Um, oh, okay. So the other friends said it must be because of something you've done, but this friend says that it could be God preparing you to face something else in the future. So the whole like trials produce character and that kind of thing. So this new friend, he comes in, he brings a different perspective. He actually, um, Job at some points accuses God and is like, God, why are you doing this to me? If you are just, why is this happening? And this friend corrects Job and is like, hey, you should not blame God for this. God is still just. And so the story of Job is this, this dialogue between him and his friends. And eventually it turns to a dialogue between Job and God. And what I see in all this is a man who is still desperate and still believes that God exists, still believes that God is um, good. You see this constant back and forth. If you read more of the text, you see Job where he's accusing God of something and then immediately retracting it. He's like, oh no, God, like I know that, like I take that back. Like, have you ever said something 
I know I've done this. I've like said something and right away I knew, oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Or I did something and right away I knew, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I shouldn't have done that. That's Job in so much of this story is he would accuse God or he would say, God, why, why did you let this happen? You only want bad for us, whatever. And then immediately he'd be like, no, God, I know that you are still good. And that's such a relatable place. Like I think back to times when I've had really hard seasons in life and I've had those questions and I've like had these dialogues with the Lord, but I still have to come back to know God. I, I believe that you are still good. You can fill this in. Despite the enemy's efforts, Job did not lose faith. He still pressed in. He still um, sought after God, even if it looked really messy. <laughs> like Job's story is definitely very messy. But in the end, the Lord ends up blessing him even more. If you read through the end of the story, there's a, um, it all works out for good. And that's just how the Lord works. And so even though this book doesn't answer necessarily why God let Satan do that or why God today lets evil happen in our lives, I think that this book gives us just like a, um, a freedom to, to not be okay all the time. When I read the story of Job, I think, okay, Job was a real person. He really struggled with these things. And so when death or when uh, tragedy happens in my own life, it's okay to have days when things are really hard. But when you continue to communicate with God and have that dialogue with him, you're going to work it out with the Lord. So that's the book of Job in a very short nutshell. We've got four more books to go through. So I'm going to move on to Psalms. Now, Psalms are poetry that expresses praise, worship, and confession to God. There's 150 Psalms, 73 are written by David. We learned about David the other week. There are Psalms for everything. There are Psalms of lament, uh, which is like the authors crying out to God. Um, there are Psalms of praise or hymns. They portray the author's offering of admiration to God. There are Thanksgiving Psalms, which uh, usually have a personal tie of either deliverance or uh, remembering God's provision. There are Pilgrim Psalms, which in your Bibles, if you ever look at the Psalms and you have like titles above them, or sometimes they give like a little description of like David wrote this, or uh, it talks about the lyre or whatever. We remember that instrument. Um, sometimes it'll say a song of ascent. That is referring to, what's that? Yeah, a Psalm of David would be one of those like titles at the top, yep. So a Song of Ascent was used on pil pilgrimages, pilgrimages, that's a weird word. Um, if we remember some of the feasts that I taught about a couple of weeks ago, when they would um, go up to Jerusalem, they would take a pilgrimage up to Jerusalem for some of the feasts. These songs, these songs of ascent, are things that they would sing on their way. So if you ever see that, now you can picture, oh, okay, song of ascent. So they were on their way to Jerusalem. In Psalm 1, we start to see some of the purpose of the book. So in 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. So the Psalms were designed to teach God's people about prayer as they strive to be faithful to the law, to the Torah, which we learned about also. While also waiting for this messianic kingdom, this messianic king that they've been promised would come. So a lot of the Psalms, as you read them, it talks about meditating on the law. It references the law. So that was the big point of the big part of the Psalms was to um, teach people how to be faithful to the law and faithful to the Lord and learn about prayer and learn about other things. 
So the Psalms, you can fill us in. The Psalms give us a model of what prayer and worship should look like. What prayer and worship should look like. So like I said, there are Psalms for um, all, all parts of life. Like literally any, every human emotion that you could think of, there's a Psalm for it. Sometimes I'll just like Google like, what's a psalm for feeling anxious or what's a song for psalm for whatever and you can find it like there's so many there's 150 psalms there's literally so many different ones in here and my favorite thing to do especially when um, i think about prayer and worship and how does the psalms reflect that is i like to read through um different psalms so you can you can either google you can literally just look up what are Psalms about prayer? And it'll pop up with a bunch. Or what are Psalms about worship? And it'll show a bunch. And they give a pretty clear um, description of what those things look like. So a few, I didn't put these on your handout, but if you want to write them down, a few of my favorite that I like to pray through and meditate on is uh, Psalm 139. That one, if you are familiar with it at all, is like the whole search me God and know me, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, that whole thing. That's always a good prayer. Uh, Psalm 51 is kind of about um, forgiveness and God's redemption and uh, restoration and things like that. And Psalm 103 gives a great description of uh, praise and worship. And I'm just going to read a little bit of Psalm 103 because it gives us that model of, of worship. It says, starting in verse one, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems you from life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. And it just keeps going. It keeps listing all these things that the Lord has done. It talks about Moses. It talks about his faithfulness. All these things. It talks about his compassion. But what I love is it says, forget not all his benefits. So we're telling ourselves, okay, praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, praise the Lord and forget not all his benefits. To me, a big part of worship, a big part of giving God praise is by remembering what he did, by remembering who he is and by calling that out. So by saying, God, you forgave all my sin, you healed all my disease, you redeemed me from the pit, you crown me, you satisfy me, like those are statements of worship and the Psalms are full of those. If you just flip through, you can find Psalms that are talking about who God is and what he's done. And by saying those things, even by reading this and praying it to God, you are giving him worship. You are giving him praise. And that's what I love about Psalms is it's so easy to uh, follow along with and relate to because I'm sure everyone in this room could relate to even one of those things that I just read. So that's Psalms. Next, we will look at Proverbs. Book of Proverbs. So book of Proverbs, and you can fill us in, is words of divine wisdom to apply to daily life. Wisdom is your fill in the blank. Proverbs was written by Solomon. Um, and the word for wisdom, yes, was it not? Oh, that's fine. But you have that statement there. Okay, that's, that works too. I have as one, but that's okay. Okay, words of divine wisdom to apply to daily life. If you really want to remember it, you can write it again or underline it. I don't know. <laughs> so the word for wisdom here in the original language not only means knowledge, but it means applied knowledge. It's talking about skill. It's referring to action. So when you think of wisdom, you're taking what you're learning and actually doing something about it. You're applying it. So that's the purpose of Proverbs. 
is to help you develop practical skills for living well in God's kingdom. We see a description in Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, which I also think is on your handout, hopefully. But it gives a description, kind of an intro to the book of Proverbs. It says the Proverb of, Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction and in wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So even right here, we see a um, description of what, what the point of this book is to do, it's to give wisdom, obviously. And we are introduced to this idea of fear of the Lord. It says fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you ever talk to Pastor Steve Huffman, he loves talking about fear of the Lord. He asks me all the time, not all the time, just pretty often, like what I think of fear of the Lord and um, what I've been learning about it and stuff. And it's a, an interesting topic. I'm not going to get into it too much, but just know that fear of the Lord isn't about um, actually like being afraid of God, like being scared of him but rather it's having a healthy sense of awe and adoration for who God is. So it's remembering that God is like, God is up here. God is high. God is um, creator. God, he is our savior. He like just placing him on his throne where he deserves to be and recognizing I am not God. That's as far into it as I'm going to go. So Proverbs, Proverbs gives helpful wisdom when it comes to all areas of life, kind of like Psalms, where there's kind of a Psalm for everything. There's a proverb for everything. There are so many Proverbs, so much wisdom in the book. And we see this general theme that if you fear God and seek wisdom, then things will go well for you. We see in uh, Proverbs 10, 27, it says the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. And then in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So it sounds nice. It's like, do these good things, uh, fear the Lord, and like things should be okay. But something to note is that, <laughs> I'm sure you know this, but in life, there's no guarantees. Like we've just seen the story of Job where Job was blameless, but yet bad things still happened to him. So one thing that is helpful for me to remember, and you can fill this in, is that Proverbs are probabilities, not promises. Proverbs are probabilities, not promises. Like I said, there are no guarantees. So like that verse that says, train up a child in the way he should go. I don't have children, but I'm sure parents in the room maybe can attest that you can teach a kid um, all the right things and train them up. But once they get to 18 and once they move out or even before then, uh, they might make decisions that go against what you taught them to do. Like there's no guarantees just because you did all that doesn't guarantee that they're going to stay in that forever. So that's a helpful thing for me to remember when I approach the book of Proverbs is yes, I want these things. Um, like we want the blessings of the Lord, but the enemy is real and death and sin is real and that affects our life. And so Proverbs are probabilities, not promises. I'm going to move on to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon to spare future generations the bitterness of learning through experience that life is meaningless apart from God. Life is meaningless apart from God. In chapter one, verse two, we see, it says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I used to read this book and be like, this is sad. I don't want to read this. Why are we talking about this? 
Um, but as I've been studying this, when you look at that word meaningless in um, the original language in Hebrew, it's this word hevel. In hevel, I think there's a description of it on your page. It means steam, vapor, breath, foolishness, nonsense, absurdity. Hevel um, is uh, like a metaphor for how life is temporary. It's fleeting. So like a like steam, like vapor, like breath, like those things um, come and go. So when you think of meaningless, really you should be thinking, okay, when the author is saying this, it's hevel, it's temporary, it's like a wisp of smoke, it's here one second and then it goes with the wind. So that's what it's saying. It's saying life is unpredictable. It's saying everything is unpredictable. It's like chasing the wind. And just like smoke, which looks solid, like if you see a cloud of smoke from the distance, it looks solid. But as soon as you go to grab onto it, it's not there, right? So sometimes in life, like things can seem like they're really good or they're like, um, yeah, just really good things. But then you grab onto it or a tragedy happens or something and then it's gone. So when the author is saying, everything is meaningless, everything is hevel, 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 hevel. It's saying everything is temporary. This life is only temporary. Everything comes and goes. Life is unpredictable. Which still isn't like, doesn't leave you with a great feeling. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, life is unpredictable. You never know what's gonna happen. You could be gone tomorrow. But the author's goal is to show us all the ways that we try to build meaning and purpose for our lives apart from God. So all of the things that we try to fill our lives with, like money, career, um, social status, pleasure, a relationship, things like that, that we are going to, that we are seeking fulfillment in apart from God, that is hevel. Like that is meaningless. Those things are only temporary. So the author is trying to show us these areas of our lives where we seek those things rather than seeking God. Hevel, hevel. I just love saying that word too. It's just fun. I'm about to. Here you go. So how do we live life? in the midst of hevel, in the midst of everything is unpredictable, things change, people come and go, all those stuff. The first thing is you can just accept it. <laughs> That's your first fill in the blank is accept it. This is how life is. Um, the author is also trying to get us to realize that, like the things that you are putting your time into and uh, things on this earth, they are only temporary. We are only here for a short period. And then eternity is waiting. So this is only temporary. And if we just accept it, like that is going to make our lives so much easier when you just accept that. The next part that kind of goes along with that is acknowledge that not everything is within our control. Not everything is within our control. So when we accept this, when we acknowledge it, Life's going to be a lot easier because not necessarily easier. I shouldn't say that because hard things still happen and uh, we still make mistakes and we still try to fill our time or fill our, uh, our hearts with things that are not of God. But when we start to recognize those things as meaningless, those things as temporary, those things as hevel, then we start to turn towards Jesus and see that, okay, he's the only one who can really fulfill me. He is the only one who can really satisfy me. Like, like we read about in that Psalm, like he is the one who satisfies us. Hevel, hevel, hevel. Any questions about that? Doing okay still? Okay. You guys were much more talkative at the beginning, but it's okay. I'm going to finish up with the book of Song of Solomon, or also called Song of Songs. Um, some translations say it differently. 
Um, so Song of Solomon, this tells of the love between a bridegroom and his bride. It affirms the sanctity of marriage and to give a picture of God's love for his people. There's always, um, I remember growing up and doing Bible studies at home and we always, you know, got to the book of Song of Songs and it was like, okay, we're just going to sit that one for now and you'll get there when you're older. Or I know some people who um, like didn't want their kids to read Song of Songs until they were an adult or like getting ready to be married or something because there's just some uh, interesting dialogue and interesting uh, metaphors in there, which if you've read any bit of it, you've probably seen. So I want to show you just kind of the, the point of this book, hopefully. There's a few different interpretations of it, but I'm going to teach you what I've been learning. So Song of Songs is a collection of poems. It was meant to be read as a whole, not taken apart. So it's this, this whole story. So you really got to look at all eight chapters to get um, the full picture. The main person we see in this uh, is a woman referenced as the beloved. So the story follows her and this man. In their eyes, it's like they're the only ones in the world. They uh, are so captivated by the other person. So we see this voice of the young woman. She delights in her man. Becomes pretty clear uh, upon reading that they're engaged. So back and forth, this story moves between them. There's a dialogue between them. The theme throughout the poems is of their intense desire for one another. So they are constantly seeking and finding. Um, so there's this kind of almost a little bit of a cycle we see that starts to happen of um, they would get separated and then she would call out for him. And then through some kind of journey, they would find each other and uh, they would start like having an intimate moment and then things got kind of racy and then the scene would end and then they'd be separated again. And then same thing. So you kind of see this constant seeking and finding that is happening. Um, in the end of the book, in chapter eight, verses six to seven, there's this description of, of love, of what they are feeling here. It says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. Love expresses uh, the basic human longing to be known and to know someone else. And it's kind of funny in later on in chapter eight, you see Solomon uh, try to buy love. He like approaches this woman and is trying to buy her love, which we literally just read about. And the first part of chapter eight, that all the wealth of one's house would be utterly scorned if you tried to buy it. And then Solomon goes and tries to do it. And you're like, dude, what are you doing? Did you not just like write all these proverbs about wisdom and things? And now you're doing this. So you see that. Um, so this story, it's this, uh, yeah, it just follows this couple and um, this constant cycle of seeking and finding and um, their love for each other. And the book, book concludes with the man and woman separate again. So it ends uh, with them calling out for each other. We don't see them end up like back again. We assume it happens, but the book kind of ends open-ended, which is kind of, uh, I don't know if it was intentional that way, but kind of like love, like love is not supposed to end, like true love is supposed to continue. And so this book had no end, kind of like how love does. So there's a few interpretations of this book, which were helpful to me. Um, and you can just kind of think about these yourselves. There's a Jewish tradition uh, to keep in mind an allegory of Israel. So Israel would be like the woman and God would be like the man. Um, their love would be considered like a symbol of the covenant that God made with man. So it's kind of that uh, interpretation of what this was the point of the story. A Christian tradition would say that this is an allegory of Christ in the church. 
um, if you read Paul's words in the New Testament, he says that uh, husband's love for his wife should reflect Christ's love for the church. So some people would say that that's what this story is pointing towards. A third point is a collection of ancient love poetry. So it's just supposed to reflect on the divine gift of love. Uh, love is a gift as we read in this book. As I think that this book is meant to help point us to God's love, help point us to Jesus, to his transforming love and to, um, yeah, his, his love. That's pretty simple. Um, that's Song of Songs as best as I can explain it without being um, married or anything. How are you guys doing? Still doing okay? Okay, awesome. So on your handout, there's a breakout, which really doesn't have anything to do with my section. So sorry, but it is preparing you for Ryan's teaching. So go ahead and take um, 10 or 15 minutes and work on your breakout, answer those questions and everything. And then we will take a little break and do the second half. Howdy, howdy. How's it going? You guys doing well? Uh, I'm sorry that the, the breakout, I know everyone's asking me questions. What's going on? How, to, how do you get to 12? What, what's happening? Um, I, didn't have a, I didn't have a good way, a good place to put it. I'm trying to get to my stopwatch. I didn't have a good place to put it. So uh, uh, I will now talk about the, the, the breakout. Well, I'm going to do my segments and then we'll talk about the breakout. But don't worry. We'll talk about the, the split kingdom. My plan is to do the Bible study tool time with Ryan, Culture Corner with Ryan Cameron. Main programming at hand, we're going to be talking about, oh gosh, we're talking about King Solomon, his successes and his failures. Then we're going to talk about the divided kingdom, which is what you just read about. And finally, we're going to touch on uh, the northern kingdom. Don't worry, Darby, I just got started. So you didn't miss anything. <laughs> I know, right? You said, you said you better not. So Bible study tool time with Ryan. I get to talk to you about one of my favorite resources that I think I've probably mentioned every single week. So, uh, uh, but there's a ton with this resource. It's called the Bible Project. Essentially what happened, I don't know, I should have looked this up, 2011, 2012, there was this Bible nerd named Dr. Tim Mackey who got his PhD from Wheaton College in Old Testament studies. He's living in Portland, Oregon, of all places, and he meets up with another guy named John Collins. And John Collins is a graphic designer and business owner. And they're both Christians, believers in Jesus. Um, and they come to a realization that there's not, at that time, there was not a lot of high quality, biblically accurate material. It was either not biblically accurate and uh, high quality, or it was biblically accurate, but extremely low quality. And I'm sure all of us have probably seen like those really corny, cheesy, like YouTube videos or movies that the effects look like they're from a Charles Chaplin film. And uh, so they, they said, what if, what if we create these really well-designed 10 to 12 minute videos where we break up every book in the Bible, 10 to 12 minutes, outline it, and then show how that book points to Jesus. And so they set to work, they started a GoFundMe, and uh, it got huge. They started pumping out these videos where they would outline every single book of the Bible, 10 to 12 minutes, give or take, and, and show how it connects to Jesus. It got huge, and now, years later, they offer an abundance of resources. So in your handout, you can see the website. I put the website, bibleproject.com. But I also sort of split up their resources in a beginning, intermediate, and advanced, um, just so that it's helpful. These are all really helpful resources, but I, I think it's helpful to realize if you look at their blog, it might be a little more challenging than their book overview series. Um, so with that... 
Let's start with the beginner. Oh, that was what I was going to mention. All of these resources are 100% free. They don't cost any money. So that's one of the other, they're completely, I mean, you can donate if you want to. They have a lot of faithful uh, partners, but they are a uh, nonprofit organization, parachurch organization, and all of their materials 100% free. So first, beginner, we got the book overview series. We just talked about every single book of the Bible broken up into 10 to 12 minute chunks, showing how it points to Jesus. That's the first resource. The second resource is the How to Read the Bible series, which is a series of videos dedicated to teach us how to approach the different genres of scripture. So that's extremely helpful. Basically, how in the world do I read Old Testament law? And how is that different from reading Old Testament poetry? And how is that different from reading wisdom literature and so forth? Really helpful series. I definitely recommend it. And the third beginner resource, they make theme videos. And again, this is like 10 minute videos where they take a biblical theme, whether it's like rest or joy, and they trace it throughout the entire Bible, that theme in like 10 minutes, really good videos. Be those are the beginner resources. The intermediate resources, uh, the first one is uh, the Bible Project podcast. Now the podcast take those theme videos and those theme videos are actually a result of like 10 hours of conversation to get to the point of that theme video in 10 minutes. So the podcast is where they take that 10 hours of conversation, they cut it up into 10 one hour chunks, and then they release one of those hour chunks every single week, talking about how they got to that final conclusion in the theme video. Really helpful. I'm subscribed to it. I listen to their podcasts every week. It's been extremely beneficial for me. Another intermediate resource is uh, Bible studies. They offer Bible studies, whether you want a group Bible study, if you're a, a, a group leader, or if you want to become a group leader. I also lead a group ministry here at the church. So if any of you ever want to become group leaders, let me know. Uh, but that's besides the point. Uh, if you ever need resources for leading a group, individual Bible studies, look at uh, their Bible study resource. And then finally, the advanced category, two resources. One is their blog. They offer hundreds of articles uh, on various topics. Now, I, I put this in the advanced category because some of the blogs um, are for normal, not nerdy people, but some of them definitely get more nerdy into the original languages of the Bible. So I just wanted to point that out. There can be, if you read their blog, uh, some more advanced ideas in there. And then the final, the final resource, this is the one that I think is the coolest because I'm a nerd. The Bible Project Classroom, and again, this is completely free. It is an online seminary level online class, classes that you can take part of. So it's an online platform. You sign up and you can take seminary level, so master level classes, graduate level classes on the Bible. Right now they have four classes available. They're all between 40 and 50 hours of content per class, and they are incredible. The first class, I've taken two of the four. The first class is Intro to the Hebrew Bible. And if you do that, you will see a lot of uh, similarities of fingerprints because it was a paradigm shifting class for me. Um, it talks about the formation of the Old Testament formation of scripture, how it came to be, why in the world it exists. And it is a wonderful, wonderful resource. And again, it's completely free. And I'll say this for the nerds that are in the room that are actually do this, it is the best online platform I have ever interacted with. And I have taken a lot of online classes. Most of the time, the platform and the interface is junk, but this is phenomenal. So check it out. Bible Project Classroom. Check out any of their resources. It's super helpful. I've been following them since they started all the way back in the day, and I, I cannot recommend them enough. So there, that's it. That's Bible Project. I love them. <laughs> they're, they're, they're nerds. Oh, and the nice thing is uh, the two guys, now it's a whole organization, right? So it's more than just Tim and John. But the real nice thing is that you have uh, Tim, who's the PhD 
Bible nerd guy. And then you got John, who's like the normal one. And so whenever, whenever PhD Tim gets like super, you know, let's dissect, John is always over there being like, okay, so what does that mean? So he's the normal person that asks the, yeah, but what, what does that matter? So they, they really complement each other well. Uh, so that is the Bible project. Now to context corner with Ryan Cameron. We doing okay though? Before I go, we sure? I know it's dreary and rainy outside, but I'm sure, I'm sure the, the sun will shine another day. So this week, I want to talk about two big cultural ideas, two big cultural differences between us in America and the Israelites in the Old Testament, the people of God. These are things we don't talk about a lot, but I hope that it's helpful to you as you approach the Old Testament and you run into some things and you're like, this is really weird and different. How do I, how do I mesh my understanding of life with how the Old Testament people, the, the Israelites viewed their life? So I'm going to say two big words and then we're going to, we're going to define them, but bear with me. Uh, first big idea is Israel is a collectivist culture and America is an individualistic culture. I have a hard time saying it, so I'll probably mess it up. Just bear with me. So what does it mean being a collectivist versus an individualist? What does that, what do those words mean? Well, why don't we start with the individualist side of things? In America, that's us. In individualistic cultures, and you can see it's on your handout, uh, here, here are some various uh, trends, norms in individualistic cultures. Individualist cultures uh, value being dependent on, whoop, sorry, in individualist cultures, being dependent upon others is often considered negative. What does that mean? Well, it means that the norm in our society, this is the norm. Now, of course, everyone will raise their hand. Well, I know about this person. It's just a trend. The norm is that when someone turns 18 in their household, they either leave the house and get a job, or they leave the house and go to college. That's generally the trend, but the trend is in America, when you turn 18, you leave your parents' house and you become independent. The whole idea is that you are independent. And if you're not independent, it's sort of viewed negatively in certain situations. That's the, the common stigma in our culture. In individualistic cultures, independence is highly valued. As a result, the whole point is I should not need to rely on anyone. I should be able to do it myself. I should be able to figure out things on my own. In individualistic cultures, individual rights take center stage. That's pretty obvious. We have the Bill of Rights. That's what our nation is founded on. Individual rights my right to assembly, my right to so-and-so. It's not based on community rights. It's based on individual rights. In individualistic cultures, people often place a greater emphasis on standing out and being unique. This is what I love. Individualist cultures, we'll look at like little Susie, right? Just think, imagine little Susie. She's got the blonde hair and, and the freckles and, and all that. And we'll look at little Susie and we'll say, you are completely unique even though every single other girl in her class looks exactly the same as little Susie. We'll tell her, we'll say, little Susie, you're the only one of you. And she's supposed to be like, yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's because in our culture, we value being unique and standing out. It's a badge of honor for us when we're unique. In individualistic cultures, people tend to be self-reliant. And finally, in individualistic cultures, the rights of individuals carry higher precedence. So that's individualistic cultures. In collectivist cultures, which is the culture of the Israelites, individuals define themselves concerning others or groups. For example, in an individualistic culture, I would say, hello, my name's Ryan Cameron. And then I would tell you things about myself, what makes me unique, my likes, my dislikes so far. In collectivist cultures, I would say, hello, my name is Ryan Cameron. I belong to the Vineyard Church, or I am a Christian. I would define myself via group identity. That's the, that's the first difference. Oh, here's another. This is a cool one. Um, so a uh, modern-day collectivist culture is Japan. 
and I'll see if I can say this right. So in America in individualist cultures, when we remember things, so if you like think of a memory, we remember things from our point of view, from like, oh, I'm doing this thing. That's how we remember things. And collectivist cultures like Japan, they remember things from like a narrative point of view where like, it's not from their own eyes, like they're removed from the situation and they remember things. They remember things in group settings instead of from individual settings. If you talk to someone that was born and raised in Japan, they can testify to this. It's, it's unique. That's a collectivist culture, their group mindset. In collectivist cultures, group loyalty is encouraged. Decisions are made for what's best for the group instead of the individual. Um, working as a group and supporting others is essential. So compared to our earlier example, right, of individualistic cultures, we, 18 years old, get on your own. Collectivist cultures, it's very common to have three or four generations living in the same household. It's not only common, it's encouraged. And if you move out, it's sort of like, why in the world are you moving out? Don't you want to take care of your family? Don't you want to be part of your family? It's a completely different mindset. Greater emphasis is placed on common goals than individual pursuits and the rights of families and communities come before the individual. So why does all this matter? What is the point, Ryan? Great question. Essentially, it matters because when we encounter the Old Testament as Americans, as individualists, and we read things like we read last week in the book of Jeremiah, and we see one family uh, or one person in one family. Uh, how do I want to say this? So if you remember last week, there was the Jericho, um, their uh, family, someone took one of the things that were supposed to be dedicated to God. You remember this last week? Well, that whole family was destroyed, even though it was just one person that took the stuff that they weren't supposed to take. And we as individuals approach that text and say, what in the world? Why was the whole family held accountable? What we fail to recognize that in the Israelite mindset, in the collectivist mindset, that individual is representative of the entire family. And that family is representative of the entire nation. They are not operating on the same uh, wavelength we are. And so we look at those sort of things and we say, that's weird. Why, is, why, is the, why does the whole family have to be destroyed because of the sins of one person? Well, it's because that one family allowed that individual to be the way that they were. They didn't stop them. They didn't do anything. And that resulted in the whole family being condemned and the entire of Israel being condemned. And so it's just, it's a difference that we have to realize when we approach the text. That's the first big idea. Second big idea is a lot quicker and a lot easier. But we don't talk about it a lot. Uh, it's that Israel lived under a monarch and America is a democracy. So what are democracies? You probably all know, but it's what we are. Uh, democracies are elected by people through elections where elected representatives make laws. The elected, the elected representatives are held accountable by the people of the country, the people that elected them. And finally, in a democracy, it's where people are considered equal under the law. The president is held to the same laws as the Supreme Court, Supreme Court. Justices are held to the same laws as me. You don't just get a free pass because you're so-and-so. In a monarchy, the country is ruled by kings and queens, like what we've been talking about. Uh, the right to rule a country is passed down through a dynasty, not through elections. Laws are created by kings and queens. That's who creates them. They have the final say. Kings and queens have no accountability. The only way to get rid of a king, if you don't like him, civil war. That's it. There's no alternative. There's no check or balance in a true monarchy. And then finally, people in a monarchy are not considered equal under the law because the king or queen creates the law. They are above the law. And so their friends don't have to be accountable to the law. They don't have to be accountable to the law. So it's a different shift in thinking. When we are dealing with Israel, we're dealing with a monarchy. Now, ideally, the monarchy should be God, <laughs> and God should be the authority. But what we see is that every single king in Israel is not 
perfect. They're not the savior. And so they mess up and they fall into the trappings of what every other king has fallen into. So those are the two big uh, cultural differences I wanted to talk about. Hopefully you're not asleep and all is well. Any questions? Nope. Okay. All right. So now the main program at hand, programming at hand, I can say that. King Solomon. Who in the world is he? What's his deal? Was he really that smart anyway? All this and more. We'll first talk about his successes. Okay, so King Solomon is the third king in, I, I don't have a better name for it, the United Kingdom of Israel. And what, what's important to realize, and I think we often overlook in the Bible, is the United Kingdom of Israel, so kingdom the Israel before it split into two separate kingdoms, only had three kings. It wasn't like they had a whole list of kings. They had Saul, they had David, and they had Solomon. That's it. They didn't have like a super long hundreds of year run before they split. So King Solomon is the last of the United Kingdom of Israel kings. So we'll talk about his successes, then his failures. But first success is that he was extremely wise. He was credited with being the wisest man to ever live. The mantle of leadership gets passed down to him and God approaches Solomon in a dream. And God says, what do you want? I'll give you what you asked for. And Solomon replies, I desire wisdom. Wisdom to lead my people. Now, I don't know about you, but I probably would not have said wisdom, just being honest. But Solomon says wisdom, and that's obviously the right choice because God says, no matter, not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you all kinds of other good stuff as well because you have answered correctly. He asked for wisdom. He asked for what Carol Ann was talking about in the book of Proverbs. The, the Hebrew word for it is hokmah. And basically hokmah is this, it's not like this, uh, it's different than knowledge. Knowledge is like this technical thing. Wisdom is saying, I want to, I want to see how God created the universe, that order that God put in the universe. And I want to join with that order. It's more than just knowing things. It's saying that I'm going to submit myself to God and I'm going to partner with what God is doing in the world. That's what biblical wisdom is. And that's the whole point of, you know, Proverbs, like Caroline was saying. So he asked for wisdom. It was granted to him wisdom. And because wisdom was granted to him and he partnered with God and what God was doing, God blessed him in so many areas and it became the most prosperous time in Israel's history. And, and literally, there were, there, the joke was true. The queen of Sheba came and visited Solomon's uh, kingdom to seek his guidance, to see his wisdom. Kings and queens from all lands came to take part in the wisdom of King Solomon. He was a big deal. King Solomon also built the temple. And so now I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent about the temple, because we haven't talked a lot about the temple. What is the temple? It is the the permanent dwelling place of God, God's very presence. Before it, God was in the tabernacle. His presence was in the tabernacle. That was the mobile dwelling place of God. It was was like a big, heavy-duty tent that Israel would move around wherever they were, and then God's presence would come and dwell on it. Then Solomon came and he built God's temple, which was the permanent dwelling place of God. And it was the central point to every Jewish person's life. Like Carol Ann talked about it, I think it was two weeks ago, I don't think it was last week, where she talked about like all the feasts and festivals, those were all centered around the temple. Their calendar was based around the temple because the temple was where you went to meet with God. It's where you meant to go and atone for your sins, to perform the sacrifices that God commanded in the Old Testament. It was where you went to worship God, to be in God's presence. It was the central hub to their entire life. It was a big deal. Like we can't overstate how much of a big deal the temple was to the Israelite. And the problem is we don't really have a modern day equivalence of the temple in our culture. 
the closest we can get, this is the closest we can get that I can put in our terms of what the temple would be like. Imagine if you took every single church in the entire country and every single government building and office and put it into one building, that would be the temple, sort of, but not really because it was God's literal presence. But that's as close as we can get to like an analogy. It's so outside our realm of understanding. But the point I'm trying to illustrate is this was a big deal, that God's presence, it's where heaven meant earth. Heaven met earth, where the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God in the celestial realm came down and made its mark among mankind. It was a big deal. And eventually, long story short, there's a lot of details. The temple was destroyed, rebuilt. We're going to talk about that next week. But then in Jesus's time, it was the second temple. The temple was still standing. It was a different one uh, because the first one was destroyed. But Jesus's day, there was a temple and Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. And after Jesus's death and resurrection, the temple in 70 AD was destroyed. And at that time, the Israelites had to completely recalibrate their entire life, their entire faith. The Jews had to figure out how do we still be Jewish without a temple? And they're still operating off of that same system today. If you meet a Jewish person and they practice uh, Orthodox Judaism, there's no longer a temple. So they had to deal with that and figure it out because the temple was separate. It was humongous, but and this is the, the fill in the blank in your handout. But through the New Testament, the author of Hebrews tells us, today we are seen as the temple of God. So the fill in the blank is temple. We are seen as the temple of God today. And this is crazy, guys. This is huge. Hebrews chapter three, verse six. This is, this is what the author writes. But Christ, as the son, is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house if our courage, if, if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. Now that word house is the same word for temple. So what the author here is saying, but in Christ as the son is in charge of God's entire temple, we are God's temple. If we keep our courage or remain confident in our hope in Christ. And so here's the truth. And this is big. This matters. This is essential to who we are. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are God's temple. You are God's mobile dwelling place. You are where heaven meets earth. You have God within you if you believe in Jesus Christ. And here's the deal. The devil, the enemy of our souls, who Mark talked about last weekend, is going to do every, sin every single thing he can to convince you otherwise. Because tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up. It's going to be a Friday morning. You're going to have to go to work. You're going to have to get the kids ready. You're going to have to do whatever list you need to get done. And the devil's going to be there saying, yeah, your life is ordinary. There's nothing special about you. Just go about your day. But the truth of the matter is, and I want you to know it because I, I feel like there's people in here that need to hear it. The truth is, if you are in Christ, you are his temple. You are where heaven meets earth. And so here's the deal. We have an option. And it was the same option as in Jesus's day. We have an option of how to treat the temple. So there were, there were two different people in Jesus's day and how they treated the temple. There was one, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. And they turned the temple into a list of do's and don'ts and a way to gain political power. And that's all the temple was to them. That's how they treated the temple. But then there was Jesus who treated the temple as a place to have a relationship with God and see what God was doing in the world and join with it. And so we have the same option when we are in Christ. We can treat our life, we can treat our temple like a list of do's and don'ts. We can try to get through life that way, or we can treat the temple like Jesus did and partner with whatever God is doing. So that's my challenge to you, partner with God. And remember, always remember, 
that as long as you believe in Jesus, you are the temple. So that was my tangent. It wasn't in my notes. I apologize. But hopefully it was helpful. Hopefully somebody needed to hear that. That was the temple, three successes of Solomon, wisdom, prosperity, temple. Let's talk about his, his failures. <laughs> Uplifting, right? So Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, but this was his downfall, right? He made political alliances, which in the law and the Torah was say, hey, if you're the king, you're not supposed to make political alliances. That was in, literally in the law. Because God said, if you do that, your heart's going to be turned away from me. But King Solomon made all these political alliances and a common practice of that day. It sounds really weird, but again, we live in modern times. We don't understand the customs as well. But in that time, if you made a political alliance with another nation, you gained wives. So he made all of these political alliances and he accrued for himself 700 wives and 300 concubines. So a thousand women in his, I, I don't what harem, whatever you, whatever you call that, and they turned his heart away from God. And they, they, they convinced him to worship their gods. And that's what God said exactly what would happen. And it's what it, it, it did. So we see that later in life, King Solomon commits adultery and abandons God. And it's sad. I mean, it, it really is. He was the wisest man who ever lived. He was given everything he wanted, and he turns from God. It's heartbreaking. And so, because of that, you guys read it, <laughs> because of that, the kingdom was removed from Solomon. The kingdom was split. And so that's what you read, 1 Kings 11, 26 through 39. The next fill in the blank, God divides the kingdom because Solomon turns from God. Solomon turns from God. What we really see here is that God was the one. We were talk, I was talking to Steve. God was the one that divided the kingdom. It was the prophet, the messenger of God that comes to Jeroboam and says, hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what God is doing. And then we see, and this is huge. This is a, a big point I don't want us to miss. God still allows David's line to rule because God is faithful to his word, faithful. And so, so God said, hey, because I made the promise to David, I'm going to allow your line to continue to rule because that's what I said I would do. And God keeps his promises. And God charges Jeroboam to follow him. The prophet says, follow, follow God. And so now, this is the most, I would say, one of the biggest confusions in the Old Testament, and I didn't learn this until later on, is now you have a split kingdom. The United Kingdom of Israel splits into two separate kingdoms. And you have Israel, and this is where it gets confusing, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel has 10 tribes. Judah has two. So Judah, the primary tribe is Judah, right? That makes sense. That's King David's line. And then Benjamin. And then in the north, it's all the rest of the tribes. Now, Israel, and this is where it gets confusing because you read in your scripture and you're like, why are there so many names? Israel can also be referred to as Dan, because that was the dominant tribe in Israel. Or it can be referred to as its capital, which is Samaria, I believe. I'll have to double check. I don't have that in my notes. But it can be referred to as its capital. What? No, no, no. I, I, think, it, I think it is Samaria. I'll have to look it up afterwards. So it can be referred to as its capital, its major tribe, or Israel. And then Judah is often referred to as Judah. So that's the biggest confusion. Does that, does that make sense? Are we tracking two kingdoms, various names? Are you all lost or are you, you good? No. Uh, any questions with that? Nope. Okay, sweet, because that's, that's pivotal. So right now, what I'm going to do for the next 
couple of minutes is talk about the northern kingdom of Israel. Next week, we're going to talk about the southern kingdom of Judah and then the prophets. But this week, I'm going to focus on the northern kingdom of Israel. Talk about some significant characters, starting with Jeroboam the first. He was the king that you read about. We see that he was given a David opportunity, but he quickly squanders it. Um, and by David opportunity, I mean he was charged with becoming a man after God's own heart, following God's words. And he quickly disobeys God, and he sets up uh, idols in Israel because uh, he doesn't want people to go over to Jerusalem in Judah to worship God where the temple was. So he's like, I'm going to put up idols. And so that leads the nation to turn away from God. Israel is now turning away from God because of Jeroboam. And this begins a long line of rebellious kings. Every single king in Israel's history rebels against God and practices idolatry. There are not any kings that are wholly good in Israel's history. So that's Jeroboam. There's a long list of kings. We're not given a lot of detail about these kings. They're sprinkled throughout First and Second Kings, and we read about some in the prophets. But one king and one queen we're given a, a more information about is King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. So we're going to talk about them. And again, this is a lot longer in the list of down in the list of kings. King Ahab in Israel led well politically and militarily, but not spiritually. He was spiritually bankrupt. He led the nation to worship a pagan god named Baal. And this is what 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25 and 26 says. No one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did under the influence of his wife Jezebel. The wor his worst outrage was worshiping idols just as the Amorites had done. And here's the key. The people the people who the Lord had driven out from the land ahead of the Israelites. And so what we see here is that Israel has now left the path that was laid out in Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter one, the people were charged with, hey, here's the law of the Lord. Meditate on it day and night. Do not turn from the right or from the left, but they did. And that led them to worship idols. It led them to become the very nations, like the very nations that the Israelites had driven out in the book of Joshua. They were practicing and celebrating the same evil and horrendous acts as the tribes and the people groups that they had originally kicked out. They were no different than them. And then you had Queen Jezebel as well, another character that we learn about. She had a controlling influence over her husband, King Ahab, and she led 850 prophets of Baal and killed a lot of God's holy prophets. And so that segues us into looking at two of the prophets we hear about in Israel's history. Now, there's a lot more, and next week, don't worry, I'm going to give you a lovely chart to keep all of it straight. But two of the prophets that we learn about are <laughs> Elijah and Elisha. Now, they have very similar names, so, so bear with me. But the main point of this is I, I want to show that during this time, people were turning away from God. They were practicing this horrendous acts of evil, but God was still faithful. He still sent people to them to say, hey, you need to repent because God will forgive. And those are the key of the prophets. You need to repent because God will forgive you. But he, he's not going to forgive you if you don't repent, if you don't turn to him. And so he's still faithful to the people of Israel, even though they're committing these horrendous acts. He sends Elijah, who did amazing signs and wonders because of God. And then his protege, the person that took up the mantle under him, was Elisha. And Elisha has a double portion of Elijah's uh, <laughs> spirit. And he, he uh, I almost said commits. <laughs> He, um, now I can't think of it. He uh, performs, not commits. He performs twice as many miracles, commits miracles. He performs twice as many miracles as uh, Elijah does. 
And so what we see here, the, the difference between Elijah and Elisha, Elijah's focus was confronting idolatry in Israel, where Elijah demonstrated the love and compassion of God. Now, those are very big overview statements, but I think that's helpful to keep our eyes on what's going on. But then inevitably, in 722 AD, the people are still turned from God after countless prophets have been sent to them saying, God is faithful, repent, turn to him, you will be forgiven. But they don't. They double down in their sin and their treachery. And in 722 AD, Israel was defeated by, and the fill in the blank is the Assyrians. The Assyrians, that's your last fill in the blank. A-S-S-Y-R-I-A-N-S. And they were defeated and they were infiltrated by the Assyrians and they were carried off into exile. And the kingdom of Israel is destroyed. It's no more. It never comes back into the picture. We never hear about the kingdom of Israel again. Now, of course, not every single Jew in Israel was killed. They, a, a lot of them were taken as slaves, political pieces and pawns into the Assyrian empire. And there's people that can still, to this day, draw their lineage back to the original 10 tribes that were in Israel. So they're not completely wiped out, but that kingdom is destroyed. And so what's, what's the point? Well, it's, it's the same as last week's, and that's what's crazy, right? Is that on one hand, we see God's judgment. We see that he does not allow the guilty to go unpunished. And we also realize that Israel doesn't just get a free pass because God chose them as his people. They're held to the same rules and accountability as all the other nations. They didn't obey God. Because they didn't obey God, they were judged just like the other nations were. God doesn't have favoritism in that sense. And that's that's what we see on that side, but we also see God's faithfulness and his compassion and his mercy that he sent time and time again, people calling them back to himself. And not only that, we see his slowness to anger. He allowed king after king and generation after generation, chance and chance again, so many chances that people didn't deserve, but he still offered them. And so we see God's judgment on one hand, but we also see his faithfulness and his love and how he slowed to anger on the other. And so that's the story of the Northern Kingdom. Next week, we'll talk about the Southern Kingdom, which is David's tribe, which we know, right? David's promise, the Messiah, Jesus will come from. And so we're going to track that storyline next week and talk about the prophets. But before we go to the questions and discuss at your tables. Do you guys have any questions for me? Yeah, Donna? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for those that are in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we are yeah, we're seen as God's people today. Yeah, as long as we're in Christ, we're seen as the people. Yep, good clarification. Anything else? Awesome. Take some time to discuss and then I'll come back and close us in prayer. Thanks guys. Yeah. I hope I hope the discussion was beneficial. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Please come next week. It's the last week, week five, and ending with a bang. It's going to be great. Um, I, there is, I forgot to, it completely slipped my mind until I looked at the, there's no homework on your handout. So you don't have homework of reading, but I mean, you can read all of the prophets if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that, I don't, gosh, that would probably take you, Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible by word count. That would take you a while. I don't know. But most people think Psalm is the longest book, but actually 
by word count, it's Jeremiah, fun fact, for your Friday night Bible trivia that I know you're all playing with your friends. <laughs> so uh, come next week, if you can help with table and chairs, I would really appreciate it. And now I'm going to pray for us in close. So Father, I just thank you for every single student here. I thank you for those that are digging deep into your word. And I pray that you guide them, that you help remind us of who we are. I pray that you transform us in your image and your spirit fills us up. I pray that you empower us to make a difference in your kingdom and that we walk out of here, change people for you. Jesus, that's what we need. We need you. So thanks for your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, guys.